So the following interview is conducted with Mechanical Engineering Distinguished Engineering alumnus Anthony Harris, who also holds an honorary doctorate in engineering from Purdue University. And this interview is for the Purdue University Archives and Special Collections Oral History Program. Tony is president and CEO of Campbell Harris Security Equipment Company, or SESCO, and one of the founders of the National Society of Black Engineers, also known as NSBE. This interview took place on March 21st, 2018 in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania at the 2018 National Society of Black Engineers sure. annual convention. The interviewer is Tasha Zephyrin. So to begin, uh, could you please tell me a little bit about yourself? Well, I'm uh, originally from uh, Chicago, Illinois. My parents were um, Roy and Alberta Harris from Collierville, Tennessee. They moved to Chicago in 1948, and I was born in 53 uh, on the south side in uh, a very, uh, very poor and disadvantaged part of town where I grew up, attended Forestville um, Elementary School and uh, upper grades center, grades 7th uh, and 8th there, before going on to Robert T. Lindblom Technical High School on the southwest side of Chicago. Um, after Lynn Bloom, I uh, matriculated at Purdue University and uh, majored initially in civil engineering, then transferred to mechanical. Upon graduation, went to work for Standard Oil Company in Chicago, followed by Harvard Business School, then um, several other companies, let's see, Ford Motor Company, uh, then I bought a Ford dealership then Pacific Gas and Electric Company, then I bought a beer company, then Calpine Corporation, and then I bought the, the current business. Uh, currently, we manufacture contraband and explosive detection equipment that we sell to federal governments, both uh, worldwide and domestically. Married with two kids, been married now for 38 years. Congratulations. <laughs> yes, with a 31-year-old and a 33-year-old, both boys. Anything else? No, great introduction. Okay. <laughs> That's quite a life. <laughs> so <laughs> going back to, let's say, high school, south side of Chicago kind mm -hmm. of life, can you tell me a little bit more about what it was like being a student at that time? Well, again, you know, I, uh, we were in a very, very poor area, um, uh, it, and uh, it was a slum area. Uh, and Forestville was a very um, rugged part of, uh, of town. Uh, back in those days, gangs were very prevalent. Uh, on the south side, you had the Blackstone Ranger Gang, and then on the west side, you had the Satan's Disciple Gang. So when I left Forestville to go to Lindblom, Forestville being on the south side, I was surrounded by the Blackstone Rangers, and to get to Lindblom, I had to go through the Satan Disciples. And uh, it was it was pretty dangerous, quite frankly. Um, so... Um, my father, who was a longshoreman uh, during the uh, summer and then just kind of hustled during the winter, found a way to get me a car very early on, and uh, that kind mm -hmm. of set me free. Um, fortunately, in seventh and eighth grade at Forestville, they segregated the so-called smart kids into two classes, and uh, out of those two classes, uh, almost half of us ended up going to Lindblom, which is a magnet school. It was one of the only two technical high schools in the city at that time. There was Lindblom on the south side for, where the black and, and Latin and, and a lot of Asian kids went. And then there was Lane Tech on the north side where all the white kids went. Mm. Um, I don't know how deep you want me to go in all this, but uh, at Lindblom, um, uh, I, I had done very well on standardized tests. So, you know, I was very confident in my ability to... Um, perform uh, mathematics, and I, I loved writing, so I was very good in, in English. And uh, always uh, thought I was going to be an architect because I was good in drafting and loved to draw. Met a professor or teacher at Lindblom, um, Ashwell Wright, I'll never forget him. He told me one day, he says, Tony, what are you going to do when you grow up? I said, I want to be an architect. And he says, well, you know, architects make money by bringing business from family business often to the firm. And your family doesn't have any business. So how are you going to make money? 
I said, well, I'm going to be a good architect. He says, you might consider engineering because then you make money just by being smart. And uh, at his urging, we formed in my junior year of high school an organization called the JETS, the Junior Engineering Technical Society, uh, which I believe was a national organization and uh, our teacher, Mr. Wright, uh, started a chapter at Limbloom. And the primary... Um, duty of the of the chapter was to expose us to engineering so we do field trips we went to iit we went to northwestern we went to uh, university of chicago uh, we went to university of illinois chicago circle campus and we met black student engineers there that talked about what they were doing and uh, i decided okay i'm going to be a civil engineer because it sounds like architecture with a lot of math uh, also while at Lynn bloom we started uh, a social club there called the brotherhood that's where I met uh, a couple of the the, the guy the fellow founders of I Nesbitt. Project that for me in this room. What do you say? What do you say? You want to pause it? Everybody. So as I was beginning to mention, we formed a social club called the Brotherhood, uh, and and the members of that organization included Stanley Kirtley, whom I'd met at Forestville. Uh, Stanley Kirtley uh, was the first uh, middle-class person that I'd known. His, uh, his family, his mom was a, a teacher or at least worked in a school, and, and his dad was uh, some sort of um, skilled tradesman, and they lived in, in a separate home, standalone home, and, and they had uh, a basement and fully furnished uh, two-story home and so he but but he was very interested in in baseball and in tennis and in bowling and thing and chess which were things that I too was interested in and so we became fast friends in seventh and eighth grade then we ended up at Lindblom together where I met uh, Brian Harris and George Smith and uh, and I met John Logan there but he wasn't a part of our, our social circle at that time so we started this organization called the Brotherhood and uh, we, we dressed alike, and we were uh, good dancers, and, you know, we kind of went to all the parties together. And uh, uh, as uh, we approached our senior year, we shared this um, drafting class with uh, uh, our teacher, Ashwell Wright, and he began to talk to all of us about engineering, and we were all in the Jets together. Mm-hmm. I was the president of the Jets, you know, it seemed like I was president of us. I was president of... Uh, uh, the Spanish club, uh, George, uh, at my encouragement, became president of the uh, Honor Society. Um, Brian was uh, in some other organization. I can't remember now. But we were trying to be the, the heads of all the student organizations so we could uh, kind of run, run the school. So do you know what time this year... Anyway, we all uh, became very close in high school, and um, uh, Stan was the first guy that talked about Purdue. Uh, when uh, it came time to apply to college, um, we all decided we were going to engineering, again, at the urging of uh, our teacher and because of our Jets experience. But Stan knew about Purdue and uh, uh, really talked it up. I was pretty indifferent, quite frankly. I applied to Purdue, Northwestern, and University of Illinois and got accepted to all three. And the reason I ended up at Purdue was because they came up with the most financial aid. So, so yeah, uh, my, uh, my first year uh, was fully covered, but it, it was loans, it was work study, and, and some scholarship. And uh, after I completed the first year at Purdue, I qualified for a full academic scholarship, which is a Shell Oil Foundation fellowship, which paid for my whole ride. And it had a little money left over, so I was able to still dress, you know, all sharp, and, uh, and I was able to keep my car on campus. And so, um, again, it was, uh, it was pretty cool. How did Stan know about, the, about Purdue or start promoting it? You know, again, I don't know. His mom, having been in education, I think, you know, they just were exposed to a lot more uh, information, as was George. So Stan decided to go immediately, and then George decided to go also. 
and and he also was middle class, you know, and he his his mom was a teacher and his father was a professional chef, and I think they were exposed to um, more of that sort of stuff. You know, my my mom graduated or finished eighth grade, my dad finished sixth grade, so I really didn't have a, a big background from which to draw. I knew that I was going to be an engineer. I knew I wanted to go to a major university, and the one, major universities I was aware of were the ones that we visited through JETS. So that kind of, my scope was a lot narrower. Right. So when we, uh, when, when George, Brian, and I, and Stan and I matriculated at Purdue, on the very first day, uh, George introduced us to a friend from his neighborhood, Ed Coleman, and then we realized that another Limbloom graduate, John Logan, was also there. So on, the, on that very first or second day, we all kind of got together and were inseparable from that point forward. Perfect. And little did we know, you know, that, that, that support network is what I think uh, contributed greatly to our individual success. I know it contributed to my success. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. So you all are now, you're at Purdue. Uh, what was the environment like at Purdue at that time? So, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, you know, we were at Purdue, um, you know, is we were at, Limblum was a big high school. So there were, I, I think, uh, almost 5,000 students at Limblum. So we were used to being around a lot of students. But Purdue, you know, was order of magnitude larger. And, uh, and for me, it was my first experience, significant experience, outside of Chicago in, in a more rural environment. And so it was totally different than anything I'd ever experienced. But uh, we uh, felt like we, we, could, we could own the place because, you know, we had this little <laughs> click. And, uh, and, and, you know, we were very different than most of the other students, black students on campus. At that time, there was about 600 black students on campus out of about 27,000 students mm -hmm. total. But, you know, because the, most of the black students um, – would acknowledge one another as you walked around. You know, everybody would wave and nod, which, which, by the way, coming from Chicago was very different for me. But I got into that pretty quickly and kind of enjoyed, enjoyed that. Mm -hmm. And uh, because of the Black Cultural Center as the, kind of the, the, the center of the, the social circle on campus, you could meet and see everybody at least once or twice during the course of a week at this one location. So, you know, because we had been in a part of this club, the Brotherhood, we all had these little clothes that were similar, and we dressed in the, the Chicago style, and I wore this little cool hat, you know, so they they called me Tony Rome because there was this uh, movie that Frank Sinatra wore a similar hat, and he was known as Tony Rome. And, and, and all the other guys had these cool nicknames, and, you know, we, we had these business cards printed up. Uh, the brotherhood, we soothe, we charm, we satisfy, and, and you know we were we we would dance, we would do the what was then known as the bop. Now they know it as the step, and and we were kind of different. And there were six of us. We had a critical mass. We made a little bit of an impression on campus. So socially, we felt pretty comfortable. Mm -hmm. Academically, though, it was totally different. Lynn Bloom was 100 percent African American when by the time we graduated, maybe 97 percent, 3 percent Asian. Now you're in an environment that was 100% white. At least it felt that way. It was probably more 80% white, 20% other, and uh, less than 1% black. And, and uh, so in class of 200 students, you know, you'd be the only one. And that took some adjustment. But fortunately, um, the Department of Freshman Engineering had begun a program to kind of help, uh, help us um, – acclimate ourselves to the to the Purdue environment. And I think it was the program was set up for academic support, but really it helped me anyway, more social support, helping me figure out how to how to fit in and navigate in the classroom. I was cool outside of class, but in class it was it was a, a little bit intimidating, quite frankly. Um, and I knew I was at a disadvantage because you know because uh, when I first got to Purdue, my academic advisor suggested that I take a, a remedial track, which one would have added at least a year, maybe a year and a half to my, my uh, program, and I only had a four-year scholarship, so that was out. But two, they wanted me to take this remedial math, and all my life I thought of myself as being very good at math. 
So I, I refused. And, and they said, well, if you take Math 161, the regular math, then you have to take the regular chemistry, the regular physics. And I said, well, bring it on. <laughs> and, and, you know, chemistry wasn't that hard. Well, it was hard, but it was, it was a lot of math. And uh, initially, um, physics was a lot of math. But as you got into physics, it was the eliminator. I don't know about, well, you, you didn't do undergrad there, right? So. Yeah, I didn't do undergrad at Purdue. Undergraduate engineering at Purdue, Physics 152 was the, the eliminator course. And it turns out every school has an eliminator. Mm -hmm. And uh, so um, the, first call, the first exam, I think I got a 12 out of 100. And, you know, that was the first time in my life I'd ever gotten mm -hmm. anything like that. So, and that was, like, devastating, right? Here. Crushing blow. But talking about it in that, uh, that um, uh, freshman engineering acclimation course, I forget what it was even called now, where uh, Art Bond was kind of the, the class facilitator, more so than an instructor. He kind of facilitated discussion in that class. And uh, between that and some of the uh, upperclassmen on campus, uh, it kind of helped us learn how to study. And uh, uh, Ed Barnett, uh, Eric Harris, and Robert Milton were three truly influential guys in my life. And that Ed was a, a visionary guy. He kept talking about how great it was going to be once we became engineers. And all the things, all the, 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 the homes and the cars and the, and the businesses we would run, he, he motivated us to want to graduate and to want to be an engineer. Mm -hmm. uh, and Eric Harris, who had also gone to Limbloom, you know, he, he had been a celebrity at Limbo. He was, he was a, a senior when we were freshmen, but he was on the basketball team and the skating team and all the teams and all the girls loved him. So we knew of him, didn't really know him, cause, uh, but we knew of him. So we said, we want to be like Ed and Eric. I said, I want to be like Ed and Eric. And Robert Milton, who has an interesting story himself, showed us how to do it. He, he actually understood how to explain physics and chemistry and calculus in a way, in a language that we could understand. You know, in the classroom, they were using technical terms in, in King's English, but he was breaking it down into, you know, spank or blackish or what do you call it? Ebonics. I mean, he could break it down in a way we could hear it. And Can you give an example of that? <laughs> it is a lot of uh, expletives, so I probably shouldn't do that. <laughs> uh, uh, uh. <laughs> so, but Robert Milton, you know, he uh, had been a junior, uh, between his junior and senior year in mechanical engineering, he got drafted and sent to Vietnam. And after two years in Vietnam, he came back to Purdue, and they made him start over. None of his coursework could carry through, and it made him very bitter. He was very embittered. So. He was angry, and uh, all that came through and how he communicated. But to us, it, it made him real. I mean, you know, he, right. he was, mm -hmm. and he was dedicated to, to teaching us this stuff. And he was, he was like a drill instructor. I mean, if you didn't get it, he, he wouldn't hit you, but he made you feel like, kind of foolish. But, but he kept on until you got it. And I remember he lived in a trailer off campus, and we'd go by there and uh, spend hours with him tutoring especially me in, uh, in physics and, and, and calculus. But as a result of all that, you know, uh, I got all A's and B's, and I think um, that first year, that was how I qualified for the Shell Oil Foundation Fellowship. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, Ed was talking about uh, how we needed to make this more structured, more formal, and, and start it, uh, the, 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 the Black Society of Engineers, the BSE. And, um, and we all were, were basically there to benefit from uh, their classroom experience and uh, the use of their test files. And, and it, again, he would always talk about after Purdue, how great life was going to be. So he, he was an extremely good motivator mm -hmm. in that regard. Um, I don't know what else but to say. But the primary connection that you all had was from the Right. So uh, we were the largest incoming class of uh, black students in engineering ever. Uh, I'm told up until 1971, when we matriculated, I'm told two or three a year would come in. Our class was 25. 
and, and, and 15 or so or 16 of us were, were a part of this BSE organization in that mm-hmm. first year. Mm-hmm. And it was really study groups, so we all just got together to study and, uh, and, and, and talk about life and, and talk about what it was like in class and, and how foreign it was and all that stuff. So BSC existed when you came off the campus? They or? started it the, the fall we arrived. So we arrived oh, in the fall of 71, okay. right. and it started later that year, around October, I want to say. Mm-hmm. Uh, so um, it, I, I don't know if it was during rush week. It seems like it was after people had rushed for fraternities and things like that. But, mm-hmm. yeah, as I recall, it was they started okay. that year. And then beyond the BSC group, were there other activities or groups you were involved in at Purdue? So well, we still had our we, we, we still had our, our social club, the Brotherhood. Mm-hmm. So you know, we went to all the uh, the games together, the parties together, and all that. And Stan currently was really anxious to uh, to join a fraternity. So he was um, really interested in becoming a kappa. I didn't know anything about fraternities, but to me, it was like a gang, you know, because they had colors. Mm-hmm. And in fact, their colors were red and white, which is what the Blackstone Rangers' colors were in Chicago. <laughs> Oh, Seriously, and they had this pledging, this uh, hazing, where they beat you in, and that's not felt felt to me like gang life. Mm-hmm. So I w- was really at arm's uh, length. In, in fact, all of the the, the brother at our little group uh, kind of hung back from fraternities, except for Stan. He was gung ho. Mm-hmm. Uh, by the second year, um, Stan I think actually pledged Kappa, and uh, his grades took a serious hit which is why he ended up taking five years to graduate. Um, and uh, Ed and I uh, both finished in four. Um, George ended up doing a co-op for the first couple of years, so he took five. And Brian, uh, well, they'll tell you their story, but he initially came into, I think, anthropology and then had to shift over to engineering. I don't think he had the, the credits or whatever, but be that as it may, uh, we all ended up... Uh, taking the, the first uh, two years together, including John Logan. And John took fewer uh, credits every year, so that extended his stay a little bit. But uh, we studied calculus together and physics together and chemistry together, and those were the, the killer mm-hmm. courses. Okay, so at the intersection of all these groups, I know the Black Society of Engineers is in the middle, in my mind at least, mm-hmm. and... Yeah. Part of it is that accurate, you think? Or well, I, I don't know what you mean by in the middle. I, I mean, you know, it, uh, it, it, it effectively was a study group. Okay. Uh, I think our, our universe outside of class was centered more around the brotherhood. Okay. Know, that, that felt like who we were. Gotcha. So, you know, yeah. Okay. And with the, so you have the social bit sort of being impacted by the brotherhood. Mm-hmm kind of filtering into Black Society of Engineers. Right. It's an academic study group environment for right. Black Society of Engineers. Were there any ways that participation in that chapter also helped maybe professionally or helped you get more involved at Purdue? Or would you say you were just in those communities? Yeah, the, the first year it was, it, was, it was just trying to survive, you know. But by the second year, and again, at the encouragement of uh, some of the, the uh, older students, uh, I joined other organizations. So I joined ASME, um, uh, uh, the uh, uh, what, uh, Society of Automotive Engineers, SAE, mm-hmm. and one other organization on, cl- on campus. Uh, and that kind of got me more into Purdue, um, made me begin to feel like a part of Purdue, I guess is a way to think okay. of it. Uh, because you know the, the the Black House and uh, even the BSC felt like it was at Purdue, but not of Purdue, right? If you know what I mean. But ASME and SAE, all of that was Purdue. So we were. I felt like I was in Purdue, and uh, Ken Ragsdale was the academic advisor of ASME, and he took a personal interest. In me, the way Art Bond had done. Art Bond took a personal interest in all of us. He invited me to his home. Uh, he helped me work on my car. He taught me how to, to tune a carburetor and timing and change belts and all that stuff. So it, it was kind of an escape. You know, uh, we were all on campus. I was in Kerry Quad, which at the time was the slums. <laughs> it was just horrible. But, you know, it was 
you know, it, it was better at home because you know there, there were no roasters and rats or anything. It was just small and dusty, and but there was all you can eat, which was great. Um, and know. Art Bond and what's the other name again? Uh, uh, Ken Ragsdale. And they were both professors. So Art was an associate professor working on his doctorate, mm -hmm. and Ken was a, a full professor in. Uh, it must have been mechanical engineering. So, so I told you I started out in civil engineering. Okay. And after the first couple of uh, weeks, we ended up um, carrying the, these transits and things up the, the hill behind the football stadium. And my vision of an engineer was a guy that wore a shirt and tie every day and worked in a corner office and, and came home, you know, not blue collar. And this, to me, felt blue collar. I was carrying this thing up this hill in boots and in the mud and stuff. And so I had to rethink what civil engineering was like. Uh, and uh, Robert Milton, uh, who, who was tutoring us, was in mechanical engineering. And, and he um, talked to me about, well, you know, mechanical engineering is a little more um, diversified in that, you know, you have more options upon graduation. So I looked at ME, and, uh, and I changed my major to ME, which is where Ed, Ed Coleman was already in. So George was in electrical, Brian was in civil, I was in mechanical, uh, John was in civil, uh, and Ed was in mechanical, and Stan was in civil. So we tried to cover all the bases, because you know, when we graduated, we were going to have, have this company and just do all this great stuff. And, but I changed over to mechanical after that, and um, that's where I met Ken Ragsdale and joined ASME. Now with Ken, Ken's uh, support, you know, he, he, he took, again, like Art Bond, took me to his home. I met his family and his kids. And uh, really, uh, these were the first white people that I really ever had this kind of relationship with. And it, it, it made me relax in terms of, you know, not having to, to be two people on camera. I could just be me all the time. And uh, that helped me um, with confidence. But I'm sorry, just pause there. Sure. So Art Bond is... A black professor and right. Ragsdale is white. That's right. Okay. That's right. Uh, so uh, ASME, I uh, am uh, the junior year ran for office, mm -hmm. became the, uh, the the chairman of ASME, and as such, um, when whenever we went to a field trip or had to send a designated uh, member to another campus or to a conference, I was the guy. And uh, I had an opportunity to meet black students all around the country and kind of see how this national organization was structured and how it worked. Mm -hmm. And I knew at Purdue, you know, we had a, a high dropout rate, a low matriculation rate. Where there were no black professors other than Art Bond. He wasn't a full professor yet. And, uh, and as I talked to other students, um, black students in particular, I found out this was the case everywhere. And, uh, you know, I probably should have talked more about how uh, the BSE came to, to be since Ed's not here to, to represent that. But uh, apparently when Art Bond was hired to, uh, to run this freshman engineering program, uh, he reached out to other universities, uh, and particularly the University of Michigan, that had a student organization of black engineers that we think was called the... Um, the, uh, the black student engineers, okay. and they actually had a uh, a constitution, and uh, they had uh, a faculty advisor, and uh, they had uh, they had an infrastructure that Art told me he borrowed and brought back to to Purdue and introduced to, to Ed Barnett, and uh, and uh, uh, what's the other brother's name? Fred Cooper. Fred Cooper, thank you. <laughs> and uh, and they, uh, uh, at, at Art's urging, formed the BSC at Purdue. All right, so, so um, uh, I forgot where I was going with that. <laughs> but I, I wanted to kind of get that on record. Yeah. Uh, and and uh, Art, uh, along with... Uh, his, his job of uh, running the freshman engineering program to help us all um, get, get acclimated also uh, provided a lot of the, the support and infrastructure for everything we tried to do around BSE. Right. Okay, 
So I had go ahead. No, I had this deep experience now with ASME, meeting students all around the country, seeing how this organization was structured. And I talked to them about, you know, their lives on campus, and it was the same as ours here. So uh, by the junior year, toward the end of the junior year, uh, John, uh, I forget his name, but the, the president of the BSE at Purdue, for whatever reason, didn't finish his term. So I finished out his term. And uh, because of what I'd learned at ASME, suggested we put together a resume book that we could sell to corporations to raise money, right? ASME had uh, a, a letterhead with a logo and everybody, all the officers' names on it, and, and I thought that was really cool. And so I suggested we change the name from BSE to SBE, Society of Black Engineers, because it sounded more like ASME and SAE, and then, you know, SB, it just kind of seemed to fit. And I wanted to put it on this letterhead. But the letterhead, of course, needed a logo. And, and by then, I was living off campus. Um, the rest of the guys were still in the dorm. And so it, uh, off campus, I uh, kind of came up with this lightning bolt and this torch. And the SB as a part of the torch, just to have something to put on the letterhead. And at the bottom, I put uh, dedicated to a better tomorrow. Mm-hmm. So um, the uh, Society of Black Engineers, now uh, I sent these letters to corporations that were interviewing at Purdue to, and, and uh, offered to, to uh, buy or sell these resumes. And that's how we raised our first uh, monies other than dues, which dues were nominal. I think it was for like $2, I think, or something. And so we had like maybe fifty dollars in the treasury. <laughs> All right. So uh, at the end of my junior year, we had elections for uh, the president of the new SBE for the following year because I was just finishing out a term, mm-hmm. and George ran against me, and and like Ed, I began to talk about what a future SBE could look like if we kind of banded this thing together and made it look like ASME. And uh, again, when you begin to talk about a future that is compelling and how people can fit into making that happen, people get excited about it. And, uh, you know, by our senior year, we were, uh, Brian and George and I were living together off campus. So we were back together because when I was off campus in the junior year, I lived apart from those guys. But we came back in the senior year and, and this became kind of a, an incubator. I describe it as a think tank where we would talk about these ideas. You know, what if we had a national organization? And what if and how would it work and how would it fit? <clears throat> and I took the uh, ASME um, structure and said, well, it could look like this and took the map. ASME, I think, had, had uh, nine regions and I kind of drove it out and said, this could be our nine regions. But then we looked at where the schools were, and there were so few schools on the West Coast, I combined all those together to make it one region, and we had six regions. I said, it could look like this, and talked about uh, uh, one day, you know, we could have a national office and a national presence, and everybody, you know, yeah, we could, and, you know, it just kind of built on itself. Mm-hmm. So... Um, we decided to have a, a banquet where we could bring back Ed Barnett to kind of talk to us and try to motivate all of us. And at that banquet, you know, using the money from the resume book, we, uh, we invited uh, President Hansen uh, to be there, as well as, you know, Arbonne and, and other um, uh, faculty. And uh, when President Hansen saw, you know, this big... It wasn't a big bar, but a ballroom full of black students that were talking about uh, uh, what was possible after school. And uh, he heard Ed Barnett speak. You know, he, uh, President Hansen got up and said, wouldn't it be great if, uh, if this was happening all over the country? And I came up after him and said, you must have ESP because that's our plan. We want to make this a national organization. And he said, that would be a great idea. So the next day, I called up... Um, <laughs> I called up the dean of engineering, who was John Hancock, and I, I told him, you know, uh, we've got this idea to make uh, our local NES, our Society of Black Engineers chapter into a national organization, and uh, 
and president and the, the president of the university is fully behind it. And uh, he told me I should call you and uh, that you would support us and make this happen. And he said, really? <laughs> like, yeah, you know. I, you. And he said, well, go see uh, Harold Amrine, who at that time was heading up freshman engineering. And so I called Harold Amrine's office and said, uh, well, Dean Hancock asked me to call you because he said you would help us start this organization. He said, really? <laughs> he said, well, okay, come to our office on this such and such a day. Um, so we, we met. It was uh, uh, Harold Amrine, who was the head of freshman engineering, uh, Art Bond, um, uh, Thomas Fletcher, Thomas X. Fletcher, who later became Tomain Rashid because he, he became a member of the Nation of Islam, and myself. And the four of us are sitting around this table, and I started describing this vision of a, a national organization for black students, very similar to ASME, that would focus on increasing matriculation rates across the country, increase, improve retention rates, improve graduation rates, ultimately try and increase African-American faculty and to make sure that we all got jobs after the fact. And I told him, we've got $2,000, and uh, we want to invite students from all around the country to come to Purdue to make this happen. And what I would like from you is another $2,000 to match it. <laughs> Our boss said, oh, Tony, $2,000? Oh, no, that, we can't do that. And, and Tomei and Rashid Thomas, Fletcher, he just sat there. You know, he's stoic. And then, so Art and I started debating, well, you know, we got to have 2000 because we got to get buses. We got to bring them in. And, and then finally, um, uh, Harold Amrine said, well, Tony, I've heard this whole pitch. And I want you to know this is the first time a student organization has come to me with money, wanting money. So I will grant you your 2000 and 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 I'll ask uh, uh, Professor Bond to provide as much support as possible for the organization. And Art and I winked at each other. <laughs> and it was on after that. That's awesome. So uh, Art had an assistant um, in his office named uh, Sandra Taylor. That's Sonny Taylor. And uh, I think she, she was uh, working at Purdue because her husband was uh, also at Purdue, I think, earning his doctorate. Mm -hmm. and, that, and she was only going to be there for a short time. But... She was phenomenal because Art asked her to give me all the support that I needed, and she went like 100% uh, percent into it. And mm -hmm. uh, she and I would sit around and, and brainstorm, and I, I would say, well, what I want to do is to invite every university in the country to come to Purdue. And I said, but I have no way of knowing how to contact them. She says, well, I happen to have a book right here that has all the accredited universities and their addresses. I'm like, wow, okay, great. I says, well, I can write the letter, but how are we going to get it all printed up and mailed out? She said, well, you write the letter, and I'll get it all printed up, and I'll mail them all out. I'm like, oh, wow, great. And, uh, and, and so this would go on. Every, she never was discouraging or said, no, let's not do that. She was like, whatever you can come up with, let's make it happen. Mm -hmm. And sure enough, I wrote to uh, every accredited engineering institution in the country. Mm -hmm. And some people think that President Hansen did that, but... That was me. I wrote that letter to every uh, credit in, uh, institution, and I got a bunch of responses back, and whoever responded back, I called them. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, it's surprisingly, a lot of the um, historically black colleges said, well, we don't need this organization because all our engineers are black. Thank you very much. Some of the other schools said, well, you know, this sounds divisive. We try to include all our, our, our engineers. We don't want to have black and versus white. Thank you very much. But we got out of that the 280 plus, we, we got 100 or so responses and uh, described them coming to campus. And about 80 schools sent about 40 kids to Purdue uh, in 1975. And um, that's really uh, when this whole thing happened. Now, I'd like to talk a little bit about that first conference because that, that was. So, that was, that's exactly where I was going to go. Before okay. you get there, okay. I just kind of want to pause on this idea of, so you mentioned that even, so as a student, you're leveraging sort of a president's endorsement on the spot and saying, okay, I'm going to go to the next institutional person <laughs> and try and make this happen. Yep. They were even surprised that you were a student organization that came with money. Yep. 
Like, how did you even think to do all of this as a student? You know, and somebody else asked me that. Where did all this come from? I think it might have been divine intervention. But, but again, you know, we kind of, as, as our group, the Brotherhood subset of, mm-hmm. of BSE, now SBE, we talked about, you know, well, what, what about this and what about that and what if we tried this? And, and uh, when, when, uh, when the president of the university uh, got up and, and, and supported us in a public way, you know, I said, "This is it. We got him now." Mm-hmm. And uh, he actually, actually, after the the banquet, when we were shaking hands, saying goodbye, I, I said, "Well, who would I talk to next?" And he suggested uh, Dean Hancock. So I, when I called Dean Hancock, I just embellished it a little bit, and uh, then Dean Hancock suggested I talk to Harold Amrai. Mm-hmm. And so when I got a meeting with him, I went all out. Kept going yeah. with the idea, and then we got to the first national meeting. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, and that that was great. You know, we uh, some students came with money, so they were able to stay uh, in some of the local hotels. Mm-hmm. Um, most of the students didn't, so we kind of had them shack up with uh, other students on campus. Mm-hmm. Uh, we were living off campus, and we had a couple of students, you know, stay at our place. Excuse me. And uh, <clears throat> the first Friday night, we had a a, a, a meeting. And then we uh, had a dinner dance afterwards. Excuse me. And uh, again, you know, us being the the brotherhood, kind of the leaders of the Society of Black Engineers at Purdue, we kind of made an impression on all these other students from around the country because we we were we were tight. You know, we all had the same kind of sweaters on, and we had the silk and wool pants, the, the cool hat with the cool nicknames, and we danced. And so even that first night. I guess we gained some, some, some credibility with these other kids because mm. we had swag. So the next day, as a result of our brainstorming, um, I decided to, to divide the meeting into five components. We, we, wanted to, we had five objectives. One was to agree on a name. Two was to agree, agree on a symbol. Mm-hmm. Three was to agree on um, a, a charter or, or a constitution. Four was to agree on where would be the national headquarters, and then five, who would be the national chair. And since I was a senior, I was ineligible, you know. But so we we decided no matter what, we got to make sure the name of this organization uh, is the National Society of Black Engineers. Uh, and so I asked one of the guys to chair, uh, facilitate that discussion, uh, and. The, the, the second was uh, we, we agreed that we really want the symbol to be our symbol that I had come up with a year before, but we had a, uh, a contest at our local chapter to how to make this into a national symbol. Mm-hmm. And one of the students decided, well, let's take the SBE, let's turn it this way and put a big N across it. And we said, that's great. That'll be the new symbol. And I, I don't know for the life of me what that kid's name was. But we said we got to convince the rest of the, of the world, you know, that this is going to be the national symbol. Mm-hmm. And I'd ask George to chair that discussion and that subcommittee. And as a, a side, this is where the controversy came in. George really took that goal to heart. So he did some homework. He researched symbols. He took the standard oil symbol that also had a torch and uh, talked about how that was a national symbol and this was similar. So we had national recognition. Um, we talked about how because we'd already sent letters to all these institutions with our logo on it, the symbol had recognition. Um, talked about you know how the lightning bolts meant impact and the, the the torch desire. So we had a story, and George pulled most of that story around the symbol together in order to convince that group at the national conference that this ought to be the national symbol. Mm-hmm. Fast forward forty years. George found those notes that he had put together during that discussion period and said, you know what, I must have created the symbol. And that's kind of, I think, how the, the, the converging stories come together. Anyway, uh, the third group, uh, uh, John Logan chaired to uh, come figure out where the, uh, what our constitution ought to be. And uh, we had our the, the Society of Black Engineers from Purdue's constitution that, that we wanted to put forward as a template. Um, we had uh, uh, clearly, uh, I think Virginia 
I think no, it was Stan. Stan currently headed up the the subcommittee to talk about um, where the national headquarters ought to be, and we had, again had a story about why it should be at Purdue. And then finally, uh, John Kason, who was going into his uh, junior year at Purdue, we wanted to put forward as the first national chair. So all, all morning long in these splinter set groups, we, they were talking about those five things, and then we all came together in the afternoon to, to listen to the feedback. Every school that attended had two votes, had two delegates, and we were going to majority rule, decide you know, what the name would be, what the logo would be, what the charter would be, what the headquarters would be, and who would be the chair. And everything worked out except for the charter. We just couldn't agree. Because there was a, 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 a faction of kids from um, uh, Cal Poly Pomona that were really well prepared. They came out, they had a video that talked about all the things that they were doing in California. They were affiliated with a group called the LA Council of Black Professional Engineers. So they had a lot of professional support. Um, they were well funded and they, they argued that their charter ought to be the charter, that uh, 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 Los Angeles ought to be the national headquarters. I mean, they, they and, and it kind of the discussion got pretty heated. So at one point, and they demanded to show this video before we voted. So uh, I knew that they might be able to influence the organization in a direction that that, that we'd agreed wouldn't be the best for for this fledgling organization. So the compromise was we would allow you to show the video, but after the vote. So when we took the votes, um, and Nesby became the title, the symbol is as it is, we weren't able to agree on a charter, so we agreed that would be the first order of business at the first national conference, or at the second national conference the following year. Right. Um, we agreed that uh, Purdue should be the national headquarters by, by vote, and we agreed that uh, John Kaysan would be the first national chair. Mm -hmm. And at the end, everybody just stood up and I applauded. <laughs> it, was, it was great. It was. We knew something special had just happened. It right. was just really, really cool. Can you describe a bit more, like what that feeling was like? I tell you, it makes me teary-eyed now just thinking about it. But it was such a. I mean, we were hugging and high-fiving. We could kind of see what the future was going to be for this organization, and so we all had a party that night, and. Uh, Sadly, the following year, John Kaysan dropped out of school, so he ended up not serving as the national chair. Mm. But um, the guy that was president of the Cal Poly Pomona chapter, uh, Bill Johnson, William Johnson, ended up being serving as the first national chairperson. And then the, uh, the first actual national conference was actually held out in Los Angeles. And, uh, mm -hmm. and they actually were able to incorporate as a, a 501c3 organization that following year mm -hmm. uh, in Texas. I don't know why it was in Texas. <laughs> okay. And I'm, I'm just thinking about this now. Like even, so all these groups are descending onto Purdue's campus from the little I know about the national environment at the time. Like what was that like getting everyone there I'm driving to Purdue now and driving through cornfields, and I feel a little funny. Yeah, <laughs> so yeah. I imagine yeah. then this was a pretty big deal that this even happened. Yeah. It didn't take for everyone to come. Yeah. What did they have to go Pe through to get here? People got there by car, by bus, by train, <laughs> by everything. And, and, you know, they were coming from uh, a, a lot of the Big Ten uh, colleges in the mm -hmm. area. Uh, again, we had that. Uh, the, the Cal Poly Pomona contingent, there must have been five or six of them. So, cause the, so they had that big group from California, nothing in between, and you know, all this Midwestern stuff. And a, and a couple of uh, Eastern schools and, and a school from Canada came. Um, it, was, uh, it, was, it, was, it was, I don't know how to describe it. We, we knew that something great was happening, but when you're in the middle of it, you know, it, it was just kind of felt like, uh, another meeting of of the the Society of Black Engineers, only bigger, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, uh, Art Bond provided all the support in terms of um, getting us uh, the the room uh, over in the Memorial Union, and and uh, Asani Taylor provided all the uh, administrative support and get making sure people had places to stay. 
Uh, so Purdue played a huge part in, in terms of providing the skeleton mm -hmm. around which we were able to put the meat and infuse the heart, you know. So, mm -hmm. again, that made me feel like a part of Purdue. Like Purdue had changed me, but now I felt like I had changed it, and we were both better off, you know. Right. And so you mentioned that in this meeting now, it's like we have this vision of what you know, Nesby could be. Right. What do you think? Like how does that compare to what Nesby is now? Well, it's funny. You know, all the things that happen now, we would talk about, but it was just words, right? right. So, you know, he had no idea what that looked like. And then to see it actually happen, it, it's just phenomenal. It's, it's almost like, you know, having a, a baby and he grew up to be Michael Jordan. <laughs> right. <laughs> Uh, but, but you know, I, I feel like I, I do get a lot of credit for it. And, and you know, I, I think what we did, we, we I get credit I don't below, deserve because we, we took a seed and planted it, and then other students came along and watered it and pruned it and nourished it, and it became mm -hmm. this huge tree. And so now we get credit for that whole tree, you know, and, it's 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 more than I I've ever expected. Mm -hmm. And so the mission of Nesby is to increase the number of culturally responsible Black engineers who excel academically, succeed professionally, and positively impact the community. So how did that mission come about? When did that start becoming a thing that we got behind as yeah. an organization? <laughs> To tell you the truth, I couldn't tell you. Okay. While I was there, the mission that, that, that I promoted was dedicated to a better tomorrow. Mm -hmm. When I graduated in 75, uh, I pulled away from Purdue and, uh, and from Nesby and from everything as I focused on trying to build a career and, uh, and, and making sure my, my mom was cut, taken care of mm -hmm. uh, and ended up going to business school and kind of focused away from technical more into management and it wasn't until 1980 81 where I really re-engaged with Nesby in a serious way mm -hmm. and by then they'd come up with this new uh, mission statement okay. and they were referring to us as the Chicago Six which we never referred to ourselves as while uh -huh. I was there I, I hadn't heard that until the 80s sometimes. <laughs> Do you like the term? Well, I don't dislike it. I mean, it's, it's descriptive. I mean, we're six from Chicago. Uh -huh. But, you know, it, 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 I don't know. It kind of took on a life of its own. You know, people mm. began talking about the Chicago Six. And mm -hmm. I think it's kind of cool. Okay. What do you think about the relevance of um, those elements that the mission focuses on? So there's culturally responsible, excel academically, succeed professionally, positively impact the community. What yeah. do you think that should mean for the organization today? Well, it, it gives um, the organization something for everyone to, to buy into, to, to hold on to, to, you know. I really think the mission ought to be to increase the number of black engineers, period, mm -hmm. because we, over the past 45 years, have not done that. And I think you lose focus when you start trying to do too many things. But when you when you add the other components of cultural responsibility and professional excellence, then you you give uh, graduate engineers something to hang their hat on, and and you give people interested in the community that aren't engineers some a way to to find their way into the organization. And inclusive is always better. It's always and in, in fact we find a lot of student leaders in some Nesby chapters are not engineering majors, but they can find a way or find something in that vision that, that is compelling to them. And uh, if we kept it very narrow, uh, that would not have been possible. So I'm, I'm happy that whoever crafted <laughs> that broader vision uh, did so. It's, it's served us well. Did you see the original vision with Dedicated to a Better Tomorrow that you developed as being linked Strongly to the increase the number, I did, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, so again, it was it was always trying to talk about the future in a way that people th said, well, if we could make that future that he's describing happen, it would be worth doing, mm -hmm. and then showing them how they could fit into 
that ultimate future. And, and I was all, always into taglines. This is before visions and missions were popular, right? <laughs> uh-huh. So for me, we needed something that everybody could remember, but that still was compelling enough. And I felt dedicated to a better tomorrow was something like that, that the university could, could buy into, that all the students could buy in. And then as, as we described what that better tomorrow looked like mm-hmm. uh, in terms of um, – uh, you know, equity and, and graduates and, and parity and, and admissions and, and all that stuff, then people could say, ah, that's what a better tomorrow looks like. That's compelling. I want to join. I want to help. Mm-hmm. And, it, and it worked. I mean, as I uh, ran for office uh, uh, against other people that talked about what's going on right now, uh, it wasn't as motivational as talking about the future. And I think I got, I learned that from, from Ed Barnett. Mm-hmm. Uh, who would always motivated me by not talking about doing well in calculus, but by talking about after you graduate, <laughs> you're gonna do, <laughs> you're gonna do this. Right. Okay. And I mean, in all the different iterations of the names, and as the organization developed, that black engineers term becomes like I don't know the linchpin of it all. Absolutely. And I know with some people it can be a little divisive, but. Mm. Black engineers, why do you think that term is so important to keep in the name and the focus of the organization? Do you mind the yeah, I mean, uh, you, you, you said uh, you were asking about the, the black in, the, in Nesby and uh, whether, whether some people find that divisive and my thoughts on that. Um, you got to remember, this was uh, the, the era of late 60s, early 70s where black became beautiful. And say it loud, black and proud, and nobody was Negro anymore or color. We, we were black. And, and so it, for that time, was perfect. You know, it just fit very well. Uh, fast forward to when we became African Americans. Well, by then, we have international members who are of African descent and clearly black, but are not American. So, you know, Nesby still fit. It still worked. And uh, I believe that um, people that are uncomfortable or feel like it's somehow divisive really just don't understand the connotation. Uh, and, and I've never actually met anyone that came up to me and said, we should change the name because it's divisive. Uh, I have heard people say some of our members are not black and we could change the name because of that. And uh, I said, well, you know, some of our members are not engineers either. Do we change the name because of that? I mean, it's all about uh, do you believe in and are willing to commit to the mission mm-hmm. and, and the vision? So uh, I'm comfortable with it. I, I hope it never changes. But if it does, you know, everything changes. <laughs> okay. And um, so I know at Purdue there's been, you know, some recognition over the years of, the fact that Nesby was founded at Purdue, uh, and there was a dedication ceremony for a torch statue, Mm. and there's some pictures here from the archives that we were going through earlier. Could you talk a little bit more about what that ceremony was and what the significance of that dedication ceremony was for you? Oh, yeah. It it was unbelievable. I mean, to to have a a key... uh, in or near the engineering mall, which is sacred ground at Purdue, was just unbelievable. It, it, it to me, it was as improbable as uh, having a, a, an African American president. So when when I heard that uh, they were contemplating doing this, I was all in and wanted to help in any way I could. Uh, they described what the event would look like, and they talked about a parade and. And, and the band being president and, and uh, uh, President Beering uh, at the time being at the dedication, it, it was truly amazing. Uh, by then, uh, John Logan had passed. So uh, I'd ask his son, or uh, ask his, his wife, if their son could represent the family and represent John. His name is John Wesley Logan III. And uh, you know, I, I remained close with them. And so Trey, who is what we call him, was there. Uh, my two sons were there. Um, uh, John's mother was there, and uh, the founders were there. And uh, it, it was very quick. I mean, we, we had a parade. There was probably 50 people. I mean, I don't know. There, we had a couple of cars, and we waved, and there was a few members of the band. And it was not a big deal. Uh, 
in actuality, but in terms of what it represented, it was a huge deal. And uh, we actually unveiled uh, the, the key, and uh, and I had an opportunity to say a few words, and uh, it, it was just fabulous, something I'll never forget. Okay. Why would you think that that was such an improbable event to happen uh, for you? Well, again, you know, um, I often felt like I was at Purdue, but not of Purdue, even as a, a senior. Now, by now, I had chaired ASME. I uh, was had been accepted in the Pi Tau Sigma. I had uh, you know, I, I chaired Nesby. Uh, I had helped recruit high school students. That, but even though even then, I still felt like I was not fully accepted or welcomed by the university. Uh, the only place I always felt comfortable was still at the Black Culture Center. And, uh, and so I, I didn't feel as though Purdue was throwing its whole weight behind me or the organization. But so, so when they decided to do this, it was a clear signal that, yeah, we, we own NSB. We are proud of it. We want, to, want the world to know it started here. And, and that was a realization that uh, I guess I, I hadn't expected. There were no signals saying, you know, Nesby is getting you know, to be more mainstream. It's just all of a sudden, you know. And it, it was great. Okay. Do you know what um, instigated the ceremony? I really don't. I, I really don't. Um, I think this happened on, on uh, Marion's watch. But I, I don't know. Virginia, maybe. I can't remember. Okay. I don't know if you know this, but I was on the search committee to find Virginia. Oh, no, I didn't. Yeah, no. yeah. I encouraged her to apply for that job. <laughs> she was all happy at Chrysler. At least she thought she was happy. <laughs> I'd also been on the search committee for um, the Black Cultural Center's uh, executive director, Renee Thomas. Mm, okay. Yeah. And I, I had been on the, um, the dean's advisory board. and So I had been really connected to Purdue, and I, I think that's why they, they reached out to me to be a part of this thing, I guess. I don't know. Mm, okay. And what, what, you're think, what you're talking about now just reminded me that when you were talking about like, the freshman engineering program under uh, Art Bond, mm -hmm. was that a more, was it a course, like just a specific course that you were taking, or were there other things that were being implemented? Is that what transformed into the minority engineering program yeah. today? No, it was a course. It was no credit course. Okay. Well, it may have been one credit. I think it was a one credit course. So, and all you really had to do was attend. But um, it, it uh, and I believe it was Art's brainchild. I don't really know, you know, what happened before we got there. But it was clearly a way um, for us to, to bridge that black urban experience to get to Purdue's rural white experience. And, and, and I needed that because, again, I, I had not had that exposure before. So we, I was wearing stocking cap to class so that I could look good after class at the, the party. And Art said, eh, you know, you might not want to do that. You know, it's, you know, you need to be able to ha develop, establish relationships. You need to want these professors to want you to be successful. And, and with the, the look you're bringing to class, you know, it feels like, you know, we, it's too foreign, I guess, for, for their taste. And, mm. and I... I Understood what he was saying. You know, I, I kind of wanted to say to hell with him, but I think you know he was right. Mm -hmm. And then the interactions with Ragsdale did that help you feel a little more of Purdue or not a lot, quite so, a lot, very much so. But you know, that was two years later, right? So okay. now I've been there for a couple of years, and um, I I made one white friend uh, while I was at Purdue, a person that I consider a friend to this day. Uh -huh. um, Charles Crossgrill was his name, and uh, he was a guy that was acing everything. He was all A student. I'd gotten into this um, electrical engineering class, a requirement in third year, and uh, I just couldn't get it. I just did not understand. Mm -hmm. And so I went to his room one day because he was getting all A's, and I knocked on the door, and he, he came and opened the door partially. And I said, hey, Chuck, I, I, I don't know how to ask, but will you help me out? He said, sure, Tony. And he opened the door, and it was like 15 people in his class, in his room, in his dorm room. He was holding class in his dorm room. 
So I'm like, oh, man. <laughs> and uh, he and I are buddies to this day. I, I often tell people uh, I wouldn't have graduated except for Robert Milton and Chuck Cruz Grill, Krause Grill. I'd still be at Purdue. How did you end up asking him for that? Who? Uh, Chuck? Yeah. Well, because you know, he was in, in the class, and uh, he was the best student in the class. Okay. And so I just figured I'd humble myself and just ask him. All he could tell me was no, but he was so welcoming, and he had been doing it for everybody else. Uh, unbeknownst to me. Mm-hmm. And so it seems that, at least at different points over the years, there were definitely people at Purdue that were helping support some of these efforts. Yeah, yeah. I don't I don't know what Ken's motivation was, mm-hmm. but he he apparently saw something in me that he wanted to nourish, and uh, he was so encouraging and so supportive, just like like Dr. Bond. I mean, Art Bond was just so supportive and and so encouraging, mm-hmm. and and Art could talk to me like like a street guy, like I did in the hood, but he could then turn around and talk to to his peers in a very professional way, and I could see how he negotiated the field, and uh, I think that kind of helped me also in terms of my, my developmental interaction. Mm. I'm trying to think of exactly how to phrase this, but I'm seeing that, so like in 1974, there was a big commitment, and other places there were kind of big pushes to support what was going on, that, I mean, at the time, this still seems like a pretty daring idea. I don't know, would you say it was daring in that context? Be doing this um, sort of thing? I, I didn't think of it as as daring. I, I guess um, I don't know. It was a, a there was a need, uh-huh. and uh, and and I don't know. There was support, <laughs> so I, I didn't think of it as daring. I, maybe in retrospect, given the timeline, but okay. it's just something that we were going to do. What questions do you think? Because I mean, you were. Fight addressing need and stuff that was going on at the time. What questions do you think should be asked of Purdue now, um, like sort of current support and future support mm. of underrepresented students yep. in engineering in particular? Well, the thing that frustrates me with Purdue now is that you know we, we still have very few engineer or African American engineers relative to the student body as a whole. And we have programs that we know work, like the Summer Bridge program, for example. We mm-hmm. know that works. And Purdue has a billion-dollar endowment, and yet, you know, they, they are reluctant to fully fund programs like the Bridge program that they know work. And so when they talk to me about philanthropy, they says, well, Tony, you, can, you should donate to these particular programs and, and, I, and I say to them, well, I'm happy to, but if we know these programs work and if we have all this money, why doesn't Purdue just fund them? Why are you waiting for me to fund them? Mm-hmm. And uh, the, the answer I got from Mung was, well, that's above my pay grade. <laughs> and so that I find frustrating. I mean, uh, and I know we have constraints being land grant, and I know we got all these other constraints, but... I really believe that if we're committed to increasing the African American population at Purdue, we ought to put our money where our mouths are. Mm-hmm. And with the so referencing the ceremony dedication, and like it was surprising, oh, like Purdue really seems to want to own this. And so now I feel a little bit of Purdue. Yep. Do you think since that dedication ceremony, there's been some improvement in what? And the support that's there, or has it sort of waned again? Well, you know, it, it clearly there there's improvement in terms of the average GPA of the students is higher. Um, um, my my problem is there's room for improvement. <laughs> there has been improvement, but not we right. have not crossed the bridge, mm-hmm. and uh, I, I, I'm not totally convinced that all the powers that be. Are, are fully behind us crossing the bridge. You know, mm-hmm. they, I, I feel like everybody knows this is something we should do, and, and, and now that we know there are things we can do that work, it seems like a no-brainer to me that we would allocate all available resources to these things that work until we hit the objective and then pull back. But I don't mm-hmm. see that, and uh, 
I find that troubling. But I do feel more like a part of Purdue. I'm more willing to write checks than <laughs> than, than I had been in the past. Um, you know, I, I I feel like Purdue, uh, at least uh, psychologically, has has accepted uh, its black students as part of the population, and that's a giant step forward. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, it's not us and them anymore. It's just us. And that's great. And if Purdue really went all in, where do you think we would? What would that look like? What could that? enable us to do? <laughs> well, I think, you know, we, we what, what Purdue could do is things like Harvard is beginning to do is say once you're admitted, your finances will not be an obstacle. They mm-hmm. could do away with tuition altogether if they wanted to. They could fully fund bridge for every student that had been accepted if they wanted to. They could, um, I mean, those are the two things we know. They could invest in uh, other kinds of retention tools like the, the toolboxes that Nesby puts together if they wanted to. And then we, we could actually see the needle move. Uh, and, and I don't see why not. Right. <laughs> so looking back over your career and personal life, would you say, I think it's safe to say, Nesby has, has had a significant role <laughs> in that, perhaps? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> you know, it's, it's funny. In terms of, of my career, mm-hmm. uh, I don't I don't know how much influence Nesby has had, but it certainly has um, given me uh, something, a way to express my passion. Mm -hmm. Uh, My passion Mm -hmm. in wanting to see uh, African-American students in particular be successful in in technical disciplines. Nesby gives me an avenue to to have that direct contact to meet people like you, uh, a way to to spend time and energy trying to make a difference. That, that's, mm-hmm. that's what Nesby's done for me since graduation. Right. Now, up until graduation, it helped me graduate. <laughs> <laughs> and it helped me develop um, a skill set that, uh, like, like learning to talk about vision as opposed to talking about what's going on now. Mm-hmm. Uh, and Nesby helped me refine in, uh, a lot of those uh, skills that served me well at Harvard Business School and that have subsequently served me well. Uh, I may have gotten there anyway without Nesby, but but it, it's provided that that connection, uh, and and I think that's the the value of the organization for for alumni. Mm-hmm. That's why I get so frustrated when people say, "Well, let's make sure we tell people what's in it for them." You know, I mean, professionals tell okay. professionals come back to Nesby because this is what you'll get out of it. I, I, I kind of wince at that because it should be more. Here's a way that you can give back. You know. Come to us because we've got programs that work. Mm-hmm. I don't know. Okay. So, what advice would you give to a Purdue Nesby student now who desires to be, you know, successful engineer, or even successful entrepreneur at your level, exceeding your level? <laughs> well, you know, what I've learned over time is, you know, you get out of things what you put into them, and uh, a, a lesson I wish I'd learned sooner was that uh, relationships and how you interact with people is as important, if not more important, than how smart you are, technically, or, or how demonstrably um, smart you are. Uh, for example, at Harvard Business School, I spent all my time trying to prove that I belonged there and that I was as smart as everybody else. And in retrospect, had I spent that much time and energy in networking and getting to know my fellow students, I think it would have served me in... in uh, much better. Mm-hmm. So I would advise uh, students now to spend as much energy in your personal interactions with faculty, with fellow students, with peers, as you do on your on your studies. Okay. And I mean, thinking back to your collegiate experience a bit, if the Black Society of Engineers didn't form when you were there, like I know you saw the Brotherhood, but mm-hmm. what? What do you think would be different about your collegiate experience if you didn't have that underpinning? Yeah, I would have absolutely no allegiance to Purdue. You know, I, I wasn't a, an athlete at Purdue, and uh, and you know, Purdue's uh, athletic performance over the years goes up and down. So I, I wouldn't feel in any way tied. I don't think I would have been glad to get out of there, and I would have said good riddance, goodbye. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, I, I think I would have, me personally, I would have performed academically well without uh, the BSE or the SBE. Mm-hmm. Um, but you know, I, it, wouldn't have, it, it wouldn't have felt like home. 
And it does now. You know, after, like I say, after all these years. <laughs> differences do you see, if any, when you interact with um, students that have participated in NSB as it is today and those that don't? Um, over the years, even when I used to recruit for Ford and for Standard Oil and, and for uh, PG&E, when I would meet a NSBE student, they would be a far more polished in terms of their presentation. Uh, eye contact, firm handshake, uh, able to talk about things that uh, other students just didn't talk about in terms of putting together uh, conferences and pulling together meetings and managing uh, uh, goals and objectives. It had a much more world view, broader world view than all of the students. And, and to this day, uh, and now I interact a lot with NSBE leaders, so I, I, I guess I credit all NSBE members as having those same skills, but, <laughs> but um, it's clear uh, students that have been more narrowly focused uh, on their academics and may have a superior academic performance may not fit into a team setting nearly as well because they haven't had that practice. And NSBE students practice that all the time. Mm. And just sort of for the record, what's your current relationship with NSBE now? Well, I currently serve on the National Advisory Board and I am the, uh, the National Advisory Board liaison to Region 6, so I'm fairly active with the student chapters in Region 6. And um, if we haven't spoken about it already, in what ways have like, your experiences at Purdue in general continued to shape who you are today? Uh, my experience at Purdue shaping who I am today. Hmm. I hadn't thought about that one. Uh, I think, again, the um, ability to relate and not be afraid to relate to people with very different backgrounds. I, I started for the first time having those experiences at Purdue. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I think I, I learned that people are basically the same everywhere. And, and so my current business, we do a lot of international sales. So I travel all around the world doing sales, primarily to governments. And uh, a lot of them have a, a lot of uh, uh, philosophical differences with the United States, in addition to, to language and culture and, and food and all that stuff. I mean, their, their, their business processes are different, um, their, their governments are different, mm -hmm. but uh, I, I approach them uh, the same way that I learned to approach different people at Purdue, and I think that's the biggest carrier. I, I don't do any engineering work and haven't for years, mm -hmm. so the technical things I learned uh, don't really come into play. But, but all the social interaction things uh, do on a daily basis. Um, and, you know, I, I hadn't thought about crediting all that to Purdue, but as I think about it and, and draw the straight line, it, it, it does link. Mm. Okay. All right. And is there anything else you would like to share about your experience in Nesby or your experience at Purdue that we haven't touched on yet? Uh, 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 I guess the only thing is, you know, I have met lifelong friends through my uh, involvement with Nesby, um, and, and I continue to, to have access to, to young people that I never would have had without Nesby. Uh, it has truly enriched me, enriched my life because of all these different acquaintances and, and associates and. Uh, and I'm so grateful to have had the opportunity, along with the other founders, to, to, to do this. Uh, again, it's, it's almost like Purdue. I didn't really appreciate a Purdue degree until I graduated. And then you tell people, oh, I went to Purdue, and their eyes would light up. and they would be, <laughs> It's the same thing with, with those relationships. You know, I really appreciate them now way more than I did back then. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I, uh, I just hope that, that it continues and other people, other members, get that same benefit. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, thank you very much for your time. I really enjoyed the conversation. Well, not so much conversation, <laughs> but I wanted to really hear your story. It was a really interesting one. So. Well, thank you. I feel like I rambled a lot, but, you know, <laughs> it is what it is, right? <laughs> All right.
We good? So, yeah. So, in the interview, you were also talking about um, living off campus. And I imagine some students were living on campus. Mm -hmm. like, how did that situation arise for you? So, in the, at Purdue, at least back then, they really encouraged all freshmen. And in fact, I think required all freshmen to live on campus. Um, but, and, and they suggested we not have cars because there was no parking allotted to freshmen or any of that stuff. But I was determined to bring my car. So I had this car on campus, and I had to move it around all over town to try to park. And in the course of that, got parking tickets galore and all that stuff. Excuse me. So as soon as possible, I wanted to move off campus. Uh, the first year, I was in Quad. second year, I was in Tarkington. But the third year, I was determined to move off campus and tried to convince the rest of the fellas to move off too. But none of them did. So I ended up living in an apartment complex off campus and, uh, and had better access to parking, which I was about to say is how I met Marion Blaylock because, you know, I had all these campus parking tickets, and uh, they wouldn't release your transcripts if you had all these tickets money due. <laughs> and Marion worked in the so dean. The yeah, she worked in the dean's office. I think the dean of men or dean of students' or office. And so I went to her saying, Hey, look, I got all these park tickets, but it's Purdue's fault. And she's like, what? Why is that? I would say, well, you know, I, uh, they had, every time a, a, a family brings a, a student to campus, they ask me to come and speak to them. And I park, because I, I live on campus, I park, I get a ticket. And I says, every time I go to a, a student meeting, ASME meeting, or a NSBE meeting, uh, I live off campus, I got to come late and I get a ticket. And I says, I got all these tickets and half of them. And she said, she says, boy, are you kidding me? You got to be kidding me. Get away from here with that. And then I kept leading with her. And then I'm kind of charming sometimes. And finally she said, give me these damn tickets. And I don't know what happened to them, but they disappeared. <laughs> <laughs> and so I was able to get my transcripts without paying money that I didn't have. But, yeah, the, uh, it was important to me to live off campus because of this whole issue of independence. And, and again, you know, being the only black or a couple of blacks in the dorm just didn't feel good all the time. And uh, I, I wanted to get away from that. I need, I'm need i more of a, uh, I guess, a person that needs to have my own music, my own space. And, uh, and, and I think when they saw how I was living during the junior year, they said, okay, senior year, we're moving off campus too. And by then, you know, George had a car and Brian had a car and John had cars and so we moved into this house off campus, which became the de facto uh, headquarters of Society of Black Engineers. That's where we did all our, our think tank stuff. Mm -hmm. We called it the lodge because it actually looked like a, a little lodge, a single-story uh, okay. home uh, that we rented in, in West Lafayette. Mm -hmm. First time I'd ever lived in a, in a house like that. How did that compare then to growing up in the south side of Chicago? Uh, we lived in a tenement. My earliest memories, my, my whole family lived in, in two bedrooms of an upstairs tenement flat. There were uh, five families living in a single family dwelling with one bathroom. So we went from that to living in a house in West Lafayette. I mean, that, that blew my mind. And it, uh, like has showed me that the things that Ed Barnett would talk about, this is how we're going to live when we graduate, I have to taste a little bit of that mm -hmm. at, at Purdue. Very motivational. Oh. And I guess that also then speaks to elements of the Purdue environment or things that were missing from the Purdue environment that led to living off campus or even having to keep the brotherhood going strong or... This, having the Black Society of Engineers, Society of Black Engineers. Yeah, you know, then um, you couldn't get FM radio, or if you could get it, there were no black stations on FM radio. So, so there was no music, right, unless you had your own stereo, and it was easier to do that off camera. I mean, that, that sounds like a trivial thing, but it was really important because, mm -hmm. you know, I studied to music, and, and we had our own flavor that uh, we were able to... Um, to express off campus that didn't fit on campus. Mm -hmm. Bringing that flavor. <laughs> yeah. I like the idea because there's even a concept when I'm thinking there of the black male swag, I guess, <laughs> of current day. Um, like what that meant 
you know, back then, growing mm. up as a black male. Yeah, I mean, there, there weren't, at least in my circle, there, there weren't many role models. The great thing about, there was one good thing about growing up in the, in the hood, and that was because of segregation in Chicago, uh, you saw all your possibilities. So, so the school teacher lived on the end of the block in the nice house, and then the, the postal worker lived across the street and then the next to nice house. And then then the, the garbage man lived down here. And then you had the winos that lived in the gutter. You had the, the Vietnam guys that came back with shell shock and the heroin users and the vestibules. And uh, the preacher lived down here. And you could kind of see all your possibilities. And you could decide at a very early age, I want to be like the preacher, I want to be like the teacher, or I want to be like the, the postal guy. And uh, now, all of those professions have moved out of the neighborhood. So the only people there are the, the hustlers and the dope guy, dope dealers. So a kid grows up, and they see that's all their, all their options. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the things that Nesby provides through Nesby Jr. and giving back is a way to see a, a, another way out. If you can't dance or, or, or hit a ba baseball you know, or shoot a basket, here's another way out. And uh, I think that's very important.